without further ado, let's get started. To all speakers, thank you so much for coming and we are thrilled to have you with us this afternoon. Before we move on, let me introduce our four speakers today. Our first speaker is uh, Munira Az uh, sorry, Nur Munira Azman, hail, uh, who hails from Malaysia. She graduated from University of Science Malaysia Penang in wildlife ecology and management. A deep interest uh, in Shawbirds motivated the establishment of Shawbirds Peninsula Malaysia project 2017. Sorry, in 2017, where she is currently the coordinator. Uh, currently, Munira and her team are actively monitoring Shawbirds population in the Teluk Air Tawa Kuala Muda coast, which is in the northern part of Peninsula Malaysia. This area is one of the IBAs in Malaysia. They also help raise awareness of Shawbirds with um, uh, local communities, with the public and authorities, you know, and, and carry out other programs that uh, relate to conservation of Shawbirds in the area. Uh, Next, we have David Lee, who has extensive experience. He has worked in uh, migratory shorebird conservation since the late 1990s in the Asia Pacific region, including China, Malaysia, Singapore, uh, before joining the National Parks Board in Singapore in 2008. David worked at Wetlands International, both China and Asia Pacific, and Wildlife Conservation Department in China focused on wetlands and waterbird conservation issues. David is now with uh, Sungai Bulo Wetland Reserve, Singapore, where he focuses mainly on shorebirds research, monitoring and conservation in Singapore. He is also currently the coordinator for the East Asian Australasian Flyway Shorebird Working Group. Okay, now we fly over the Straits of Malacca. We meet with Chairunas Adaputra, our third speaker. Chairunas had been uh, fascinated with wild birds since his first year in college in 2009. His passion led him to establish long-term monitoring for migratory shorebirds on the east coast of northern Sumatra. He conducts a lot of field surveys, uh, carry out many community development, raises public campaigns, excuse me, and works with uh, government and local people to conserve migratory shorebirds that face habitat changes, poaching, and all kinds of other threats. But uh, last but not least, we have Yong Ding Li. Uh, Ding Li studied ecology at the Australian National University and has worked widely in Malaysia, Indonesia, the Philippines, and Australia on bird ecology and conservation. He currently coordinates regional projects on the conservation of migratory birds for Bird, uh, bird Life International. He works closely with Spoonbill Sandpiper Task Force to advance the preservation of the species. So we have four experts from four different organizations who are you know, going to be sharing with us so much information on, on migra migratory birds, on migration, bird migration, shorebirds, et cetera. And I am so excited uh, to, to hear all your sharings. Uh, I will now hand over to Munira. Are you ready, Munira? Yes, I'm ready. Start session? Sure. Okay, great, wonderful. Yeah. So uh, I, I'll... Well, yeah, can you... yeah I, I can hear you. Uh, again, can you can you try your, your mic again? Hello? Yeah, okay. So get closer to the mic because it's kind of like, uh, yeah. Okay. All right, great. So uh, I'll, I'll hand this over to you, yeah? Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Nurul. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and good afternoon to everyone. Thank you to our moderator for today, Dr. Nurul Sami, which is also SPMP's uh, project advisor. <laughs> so uh, I would like to welcome to the other three amazing speakers today um, from Singapore, Mr. David Lee, Mr. Ding Lee, and one representative from Indonesia, Pak Charunas. And I also want to welcome our audience in Facebook Live. Thank you for joining us today. So I've been given 10 minutes. So uh, let me sh uh, share my screen, um, my slide. Okay, this is my first slide. Okay, I've been given uh, around 10 to 15 minutes to share about a brief introduction on uh, Shawbirds Peninsula Malaysia Project, our findings and activities, and our dream for Teluk Aitawa Kuala uh, Okay, let me start uh, with this. Okay. Who are we? Okay, uh, my name is Nur Munira. Um, I was born a little bit uh, background of myself. I was born in Gopeng Perak and now live in Sungai Petani Kedah. 
uh, married and have uh, two uh, uh, has two kids. At the beginning of my journey as a researcher, uh, I started my research project on terrestrial birds. We focusing on um, birds diversity in forests and man-made habitat. But everything has changed when I met this guy, <laughs> Muhammad Nasir. So uh, uh, he is the one who forced me to learn about shorebirds. Okay, so he encouraged me to, to study birds and uh, to show birds and go to the field every weekend. We, we, we go to the field every weekend when we have time and we will spend time together uh, to find any interesting record for show birds in Teluk Aitawa. So I, I tend to share uh, my uh, findings in my personal uh, Facebook account. And later on, uh, my close friend, Dr. Aina Sana, uh, in the picture, yeah, on the on the on the bottom right, um, uh, asked me, uh, uh, Kamun, why why not you set up a Facebook page for showbirds? So from there, I started to create logo for showbirds, uh, for for SPMP and find the best name for uh, showbird uh, Peninsula Malaysia project. And after a while, Dr. Nurul Salmi coming in. Uh, she is uh, my uh, ex supervisor during postgraduate studies. Mm -hmm. And so we are very close. We always seek uh, her opinions whenever we need uh, for SPMP. So now she is our project advisor. Okay. So there are four of us in the main, okay, the main people in this uh, project. Okay, this is our vision uh, to see uh, TAP, uh, which is Teluk Aitawa Kuala Muda, uh, to become a protected area and be the first EAF uh, flyway site in Peninsula Malaysia. There are two objectives uh, in, the, in, in this project. The first one, to conduct research, and the second one, uh, uh, to conduct outreach program. Okay, to make sure that we are in the right track, uh, we start to collaborate with local and international organizations. Alhamdulillah, from time to time, our networking become widened and stronger. Yeah? So we also work closely with local communities and authorities, for, for example, the Fishermen Associ Association and Sebram Prize City Council to ensure we can reach the communities of Teluk Aitawa very well. So, um, okay, now let uh, me bring you to our study site. Okay, uh, this is Teluk Aitawa Kuala Muda. I will focus now in Teluk Aitawa Kuala Muda, Coast Penang. Okay, why? This area is very special because it receives thousands of migratory shorebirds every year. It has been recognized by BirdLife International as one of important bird and biodiversity area in Peninsula Malaysia. Other than Teluk Aitawa Kuala Muda Coast, IBA for shorebirds in Peninsula Malaysia, we have a uh, North Central uh, Selangor Coast, and in Borneo, we have uh, Bako Bunta Bay. So, so however, for Teluk Aitawa Kuala Muda, it is not protected and receive threats of, of development. Yeah? So for your information, uh, Teluk Aitawa Kuala Muda is the only intact mangrove forest, mangrove forest that remains in Pulau Pinang, in Penang. So it is our responsibility to make sure this in, uh, important ecosystem is conserved and protected. So this is some views uh, from, from our area, from our study site during the high tides, okay? So if you can see, the mangrove is about uh, 10 kilometer long, it's about 600 hectare and two kilometer uh, um, width at the maximum point. Yeah? Okay, this is another picture during low tides. As you can see, humans and birds are sharing, yeah? are sharing the same habitat to find their food sources. So this area is very valuable, valuable not only for the wildlife but also for us. Okay. Okay. Let me take you to the uh, to see the major flyway that we have in this world. Okay. We basically we have around nine flyways, uh, migrat uh, or migratory route for birds, and this uh, all has been used by fifty million water birds, which including twenty eight uh, globally threatened species. As you can see in the map, Malaysia is located in the middle of the East Asian Australasian flyway. Okay. And Teluk Aitawa also in the, in, in the black circle. So um, I, I also want to highlight our strength in SPMP. We are very lucky because we are surrounded with uh, experts. Yeah? Uh, Mr. Dave, Mr. M Mr. Kanda, there are people who always be there to help and give their ideas and thoughts uh, whenever we need uh, their help. Yeah? 
So in Teluk Tel Tel Aitawakal Muda, we found at least 54 species of shorebirds between 2017 until now. Just a quick uh, sharing on shorebirds ecology. For those who are new to shorebirds, might have this kind of question, yeah? Uh, what, what is shorebirds? Uh, why they have to migrate? And why don't they stay here and breed, yeah? Okay, for your information, shorebirds is one of the subgroup under water birds. They can be found on the shorelines during their migration. They eat worms, crabs, and many other marine invertebrates uh, on the mudflats. However, uh, in their breeding countries, uh, they live in the, in the grassland. So they will eat berries and insects. They need to migrate twice a year. Why? Uh, yeah, because to avoid, uh, to avoid wind, uh, freezing environment during winter season. So they travel north to south and back again to north uh, for their breeding, breeding time. So, uh, if you have any question regarding to shorebirds, now is the time you can chat on the Facebook uh, uh, comments and ask uh, anything about shorebirds. We are here uh, to, to, to share anything that we know. Yeah, okay. Okay, so, okay. Uh, during the migration, yeah, they need to stop and rest to refill their energy. However, they are, they are facing uh, various types of uh, threats. For example, reclamation, habitat loss, illegal trapping, and pollution. In my personal uh, observation in Teluk Aitawa Kuala I can say plastic pollution is the major uh, threat to this bird, okay? And also habitat conversion. Because um, Teluk Aitawa Kuala has been marked yeah, has been marked as a place for aquaculture industrial zone. Can you imagine this is industrial scale, not the small scale, but the big, big, big scale. Yeah? Although the status of the project is still pending, but um, we have to ensure this is not going to be happen in, in, in the future. So we still continuously uh, do our job to get in touch with the locals, collaborate with authorities in every initiative that we are, uh, that we are conducted. So we hope that people over there can have a man's uh, mind, mindset that they need to protect this area. They must be the be the frontliners to their own place. Yeah. yeah? Okay. Uh, these are abundance of threatened shorebirds recorded in Teluk Aitawa Kuala from 2019 to 2020. Uh, with the highest uh, abundance is uh, red net steel and the lowest is far eastern Kalu. Okay, here are some of the photos for threatened species. Uh, Great North, uh, Northman Greenshine. Recently, we found seven, uh, around um, 100 something. Eh? Or, uh, yeah, if I'm not mistaken, 100 something of Northman Greenshine in the Raitawa. Okay, I have the video. Okay, so uh, yeah, again, some near. Uh, we have actually uh, three endangered species and five near threatened species in the Raitawa. Okay, um, in SPMP, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we are very dedicated in monitoring shorebird species uh, throughout the season, just uh, to ensure that we are up, uh, updated with the number of species from time to time. So this is another important part that I think it is necessary necessary to do in build engage uh, to do uh, the uh, engagement with the local communities. Okay. Uh, this is the first event that we have, uh, uh, we, we did on 2019. This is the first event with the locals. It's a very, very um, exciting to see huh, Makcik Pakcik, the uncles and aunties. Uh, we bring them to, to, to see the shorebirds, yeah? Okay. Okay, this is the another example, uh, engagement with local communities. This is uh, the celebration of World Wetlands Day. This is just before NCO. Uh, it's happen, happened on 29th of February, 2020, uh, just before NCO. Okay. Okay, we also uh, try to raise awareness on shorebirds through arts and exhibition. For example, our photo, this uh, great, uh, great knot, uh, photographed by Muhammad Nasir. Uh, this photo has been selected as uh, top 20 photos and displayed during International Congress for Conservation Biology, ICCB 2019 in Kuala Lumpur. Yeah? Okay, we also... Um, 
do an, another exciting things eh? uh, mural uh, this idea uh, is uh, the idea is we want to make uh, sure but it's visible to everyone uh, okay so uh, whenever people come to Teluk Aitor Komoda they can uh, they can realize that oh there is a uh, showbird in in this area so the next mural uh, uh, is coming soon in Whispering Market Kuala Muda hi okay. Munira you have three more minutes okay minutes. okay so um, we also establish our own uh, YouTube channel. Uh, this is also to make uh, people um, uh, accessible to our video on showbirds. Okay, this is uh, not to forget, this is our dream. Uh, we hope one day we can have our own gallery for showbirds at Teluk Aitawa. So people can come and gain knowledge on showbirds, yeah? Okay, this is the example that I imagine in the, in the, in the gallery one day. Okay, so. Uh, lastly, I want to share one findings on shorebirds in Teluk Aitawa. This is a common red shank uh, with satellite uh, tracker. This is, um, we found in Kuala Penang in 2019. This common red shank was tagged by our friend from Singapore, Mr. David. Now, Mr. David are here, uh, yeah, is here today. So after this, Mr. David may want to, story, uh, to, to share with us the story of the journey of these birds during its migration back to their breeding, uh, to their breeding ground. Okay, uh, I would like to thanks to my team uh, uh, of Shawbirds Peninsula Malaysia Project, local communities of Teluk Aitawa, uh, to the to the our supporters, ground providers, and collaborators, Jedi, and all of you here. Thank you for 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 listening me. All right, thank you so much, Munira. That was a very nice uh, condensed uh, overview of uh, what you've been doing. Uh, since 2017 uh, and uh, there's still a lot of work to be done in TAT and uh, like Munira said, uh, TAT is now um, very much, I wouldn't say, um, well I would say, I would say uh, outrightly, it is very much threatened with uh, development especially aquaculture because the area has been has been marked like Munira said for uh, a, a large scale aquaculture uh, project which we are very much trying to you know uh, make the authorities and um, government, local government understand about the importance of the place, not only locally, but also globally, you know, because TAT is one of the stopovers for along the uh, flyway. So that is, that is something that the, the government should really treasure, actually, you know, and try to protect and, and conserve. Right. So uh, next speaker, we will head over to David. David, are you ready, David? Yes, I am. Yeah, okay. Uh, pass the mic to you then. Thank you. Okay, uh, give me a moment to do a share screen. Uh, okay, uh, so it's a great pleasure to be here, uh, invited by the Shower Peninsula Malaysia team uh, to join this uh, online uh, forum during this uh, World Mike Tory birthday. Um, personally, I have actually have a strong connection with Tolu Aitawa myself. Uh, I worked in Malaysia for seven years uh, before I came to Singapore. Uh, in 2004, if I don't recall wrongly, we actually organized a sober day event at Tolu Aitawa. Yeah, so uh, to me, this is an amazing conservation effort. We knew the road along and uh, the effort uh, is need to be carried on continuously. So conservation cannot be done in one day. So starting about 20 years ago and now uh, we are still carrying on. So that's why I'm so impressed with this team uh, that's led by Dr. Munira uh, to carry on this conservation effort. Uh, so although I couldn't provide more support as uh, uh, on site, uh, but uh, I will do my best uh, to be with the team and uh, in the future as well as my role as a coordinator for the Shelburne uh, Working Group for the Flyway. Yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, okay, uh, what I'm doing today is uh, what uh, Dr. Munira was uh, in, invited, interested, to understand about shower migration, yeah? 
Uh, so over the years, uh, Singapore has done a bit of uh, shower study. If you don't know where this Sungai Bulu wetland is, uh, Sungai Bulu wetland reserve is on the northwest of Singapore. Yeah, one of the four nature reserves in Singapore. Yeah. So if you do have a chance to come to Singapore uh, after the COVID uh, situation is settled, please do come to visit us. Okay, so Sungai Bulu uh, is a showered network site um, in the East Asian Australian Flyway. Um, and uh, uh, we were one of the important sites, uh, though a uh, number of birds may not be as high as the other site. So shower study has been carried out on the site since 1990, over the past 20 or 30 years actually, more than 12,000 birds of 100, more than 140 species has been run um, in a reserve. So uh, over the time, different method has been used uh, to study the bird. Uh, back to 1990, metal range was used, so the bird can be, um, the information of the bird can be gathered when recaptured. So over the time, the color flagging protocol has been developed on the flyway. A green over white color has been assigned for Singapore. And later on, we use this numbered in gray flag so that birds don't have to be recaptured so that individual information can be gathered. Yeah. So with this uh, improving of uh, measure for bird study over years, uh, information has been gradually collected through observations along the flyway uh, birds have been seen in quite a number of countries and as well as the number of species has been recorded. Yeah? So this gives us some preliminary information where the bird go, but the detail of this information was not able to be obtained because we are not sure after birds stopped where they going at their breeding ground or between the breeding ground and wintering ground where they stop. So to further understand the shower migration, we have decided to do a migration study by taking on technologies that are available. So we aimed on mainly medium to large bird with a technology that are available, trying to understand their migration route and how, uh, what's the stopover and wintering ground. So one of the technology we employed is this geolocator tagging in the early days because it's a cheap measure but requires the bird to be recaptured. So the device actually recording sunrise and sunset data, therefore translate to latitude and longitude. Even though it's a lack of accuracy, but still give information on where the bird actually stops and breeding in general. So during 2014 to 2015, we deployed a tracker on 99 birds on red sand. The reason we put on red sand is also because this is a more easier recapture bird from our historic data. So in the end uh, of uh, 2018, we actually got uh, data from eight adults and one juvenile, so residents. Then further to this study, we have uh, obtained satellite tracking device, which adds a 9.5 gram and 9 gram um, from this company, Micro Telemetry. So we were able to obtain information for a few species. Um, of uh, shorebird, including red sank, windbrows mainly, uh, as well as green flower, golden flower, and uh, uh, common green shanks. This study is not only at the Sungai Bulu, but as well as Plow Bin in Singapore. 
So this is used a general migration of the bird we actually captured in 2017. So in that year, we had a 15 shorebirds tapped. And then uh, we had 11 birds undertook the northward migration and 10 of them reached to the breeding ground. And with one tracker lost signal, so nine start returning. And eventually eight of the bird has returned to Singapore. So for this particular bird that uh, Munira uh, was uh, highlighted just now, and this common red shank WU, yeah? WU is the flag number of this individual bird. And we were amazed that this bird actually took a direct crossing of the Himalayans and returned to Singapore afterward. So this is one of the very amazing findings uh, we, we, we gathered and uh, it's indeed uh, impressive that uh, um, this is a very new information we got and the first documentation of shorebird actually can fly across Himalayans. So uh, this WU was uh, migratory uh, second year in 2019, uh, second May, seen in Tolua Itawa. Yeah. So uh, which was not captured by the satellite data because uh, the satellite actually normally took two days to rest, to charge it off, uh, so that uh, the bird can continue send signal. So uh, it was a very short stop, maybe just a few hours, uh, probably due to a bad weather, uh, which currently now outside my window, there's a thunderstorm. So in this kind of situation, um, birds do intend to land uh, so that they could migrate successfully. So uh, this actually field observation actually add on to data of satellite tracking. That's very impressive as well. Thanks a lot for the effort of the uh, team. Uh, and also thanks to other observers that uh, keep on making effort uh, to search for the bird in the field. So uh, in general, uh, uh, we had uh, 10 resident tracked uh, to the breeding ground through our study of geolocator study and the satellite tracking. So we noticed that three of the seven birds actually did a, a direct Himalayan crossing uh, during northward migration, while the other few birds had tried to avoid a direct crossing, maybe having a gradual uh, altitude increasing instead of sharp increasing. So, but on the way south, probably they have already established the, the, the condition or get used to the condition of the uh, high attitude because they breed there for a few months, uh, two months. So actually um, six birds actually decide to undertake a direct crossing while the rest, uh, you know, uh, follow the, the age of the Himalayan. So, um, we also try to gather the ring and flagging data from the ring centers around the uh, East Asian or Tradition Flyway. And we noticed that uh, the residents generally take two migration routes. Uh, one of the routes is a bird that wintering in you know, Thailand, Peninsular Malaysia, and uh, Sumatra. Uh, Singapore would actually mostly breed in Tibet and High Plateau while the bird from east part of Southeast Asia, you know, Philippines, um, you know, um, Kalimantan, uh, the, uh, maybe some individuals from this uh, Sumatra uh, or Peninsular Malaysia uh, took this uh, East Asian uh, migration route uh, together with a bird that uh, from Taiwan, you know, um, Japan, uh, up to uh, the um, breeding in North China, North uh, uh, the, uh, um, you know, um, Japan, uh, and uh, um, Russia. Yeah. 
So, so uh, that's uh, one of the bending. We feel that actually two main migration route uh, along the flyway. Um, then, um, okay, for Wimbros, uh, uh, it's quite uh, surprising findings that actually one of the five adult birds has been tapped, actually also took a Himalayan crossing, which is a totally a Central Asian flyway instead of East Asian flyway. So that's very interesting, and we never knew the bird would actually go to Central Asia, India, you know, um, to migrate. But uh, this uh, satellite were able to come from these new findings. Yeah. So, um, so that's the main findings we, we had so far. Uh, so uh, we, we were quite happy to share with some of the results, and it had been just published at the end of last year and people can download this paper free uh, to having more details. And we have ongoing study. We hope we, we will be able to share this in the future. Yeah, so that's uh, what I'm sharing today. And thank you very much. OK, David, thank you so much, David. That was such a, such a you know, amazing uh, study done over a number of years, the, the, the result of uh, hard work and persistence yeah, with a lot of uh, different people and uh, across different countries and so on. And I think David is an example of how migratory birds connect people and countries. Uh, and I, I personally have been to Sungai Bulo Wetland Reserve and it's an amazing place. Although unfortunately I was there during the, not the migratory season. Amazing place, highly recommended, uh, very educational as well. I just love the setup and the whole landscape. Yeah. Um, and uh, we can see from David's um, presentation, you know, the use of technology is so, so important in collecting data, collecting good, uh, you know, giving us good signs uh, and to help us to make decisions, <clears throat> especially conservation decisions. And a geolocator study, if not for, for, the, for technology, we wouldn't know that they cross over the Himalayan mountains like that. It's amazing to see what feet, you know, the, the, the birds undergo. And, uh, and, and it's amazing also to see that you've published the papers and feel free for anyone interested to, to get the paper. I actually found the paper uh, uh, earlier as well uh, uh, on the internet, I downloaded it. Thank you, David. Okay, now uh, we, we'll move on to the next speaker. The third speaker is uh, Chairunas. Okay, uh, so Sh Chairunas will share with us uh, what he's doing in, uh, in Sumatra, Sumatra Utara, North Sumatra. Okay. Over to you, Charunas. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Ibu Nurul. Okay. Let me show my presentation. You can see my screen? Yes. Very well. Thank you. Okay. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Hairunas Ada Putra. You can call me Chai. I'm living in Medan City in North Sumatra, Indonesia. And firstly, I want to say thank to Sorbet Peninsular Malaysia Project and Jedi who invited me to join in this webinar. So I want to talk about our project in uh, Northern Sumatra about Sorbet Research and Conservation Project. The Eastern coast of, North, of Sumatra in Indonesia is known as important area for staking and wintering site of migratory sorbet and it is support many globally threatened species in the East Asian Australian flyway with more than 2000 kilometer long from Aceh in the west part and Lampung in the east part. So it will take a lot of resources to protect the migratory sorbet and also to conserve its habitat. At the moment, there are only two sites that identify as flyway network site in Indonesia. That are Wasur National Park in Papua, in the East Part Indonesia, and also Sembilang National Park in Sumatra Island. Uh, there are some study come from Sumatra Island, which is confirm the importance of Sumatra Island for migratory sorbet. But I realized that migratory sorbet are still far from public attention and also for conservation. 
So initially we we'll, with help from various friends and colleagues, we established Sumatran Sorbet Research and Conservation Project in 2018, which worked on research and monitoring of migratory sorbet and actively involved on sorbet hunting and killing problem and tried to communicate, educate, and public awareness campaign on sorbet conservation and also making collaboration with all level community and stakeholder in terms to conserve the migratory sorbet. For the first time, we were focused in northern part of Sumatra Island that comprise two provinces that is Aceh and North Sumatra province. We do sorbet survey and identify all potential key sites for sorbet. After that, we try to propose those key sites as protected area at national level or international level. We can see in the big picture, uh, the red line is the location that we are work on. We start our survey from Aceh province, which is northern part of the island of Sumatra that stretch more than 400 kilometers long. We visit at least 29 locations, most of them are fish pond habitat. And we identify two key important sites that potentially proposed as plywood network site or Ramsar site. That is, that are uh, Ulematang fish pond and Kuala Pare fish pond. At the North Sumatra province, we successfully visit more than 50 sites and we identify seven potential sites for flyover necro site or Ramsar site in the future. As long as we know, there are many papers showing the loss of population of migratory sorbet year by year in the East Asian Australian country. And it is also occurred in Sumatra, Indonesia. There are massive changes from natural wetland into human modified landscape. In many cases are for oil palm industry, fisheries industry, and also for human settlement development. Unfortunately, most of the natural wetland is habitat for migratory sorbet. Furthermore, illegal hunting still occur in Sumatra, Indonesia. Uh, for the example, in Sujono Beach in North Sumatra province. Sujono Beach is a ecotourism area. Many local people come to Sujono for a weekend and looking for oyster. And some of them also hunting the migratory sorbet uh, that we can say in the picture below. And also this site uh, very close to the industrial area. As we can see on the picture, the people looking for oyster on the mudflat and on the foreground, we can see the flock of sorbet, green knot, and we can see on the background is industrial area. Sujono Beach provide large intertidal mud plant, which, which is provide food for migratory sorbet. We can see the highest count for the site is more than 10,000 individual, and the site also support more than one person, EAAF, Population for Northman Green Sang, Eurasian Carlyu, and Asian Dewitcher. The site is also as habitat for globally endangered resident milky stock. We know conservation effort at the site level will depend on local communities. So after we, we identify the key important site, we bring the issue to the local people as also to the national government and international community. At the national level, we also involve our study result in the national action plan. So we propose some recommendations to the government to conserve the key important site. We also increase public awareness campaign among local community by actively involved in international events, such as World Migratory Birthday, like we do today. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Charuna. So that's a, a, a quick overview from what 
uh, what our friends in Sumatra, North Sumatra is uh, up to. Okay, uh, then maybe we will have questions afterward. We can get more information from uh, from Charunas on the activities there. Okay, Dingli, uh, I, I think we can get you to go next. All right. Okay, okay. I'm going to do a share screen. Yeah. All right. Is, uh, is my screen okay for, on your side? Yes. Okay. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks uh, once again to um, the Jedi team and uh, to Munira's team, you know, uh, uh, for hosting this event and inviting some of us uh, from the region to share our experiences um, and try to uh, promote the case for shorebird conservation in Southeast Asia. I think uh, we've had a really um, um, dense uh, lineup of uh, updates from the region um, and you can see all kinds of uh, exciting conservation developments happening on both sides of the Malacca Straits. I think that's very exciting times for us in terms of shorebird conservation. Um, my presentation is going to be a bit more general um, and I would like to uh, basically uh, revisit uh, the East Asian Australian Flyway and try to contextualize some of the work that we do in this part of the world in the bigger scheme of things. Um, and also building on what uh, David has presented, building on what Munira has presented, building on what Chai has presented um, and uh, give you that overview of what are the important things we need to do to protect our shorebirds going forward. So uh, first and foremost, I want to bring us to the, the regional context, the continental context. Why is Asia important for bird conservation? Um, I'm not sure if anybody has actually tried to count the number of bird species we have in Asia, but I once tried to do that and I realized that the number was quite big. It was more than 3,000. Uh, but when you look at it in a global context, you are really seeing that the, uh, uh, quite a large majority of the world bird species are found in Asia, about uh, three out of 10 species. So about nearly close to uh, a third of the world's uh, bird diversity is in Asia. And going one level down Asia, I mean, in Asia, some areas have more birds than others, but Southeast Asia really comes clearly to us to be the most important part of Asia. Uh, for bird conservation, for bird diversity. And for people living in Southeast Asia, we often may not realize how important we are as a region. But when these things are put into perspective, you'll be struck that you know, countries like Malaysia, Indonesia, they, uh, you contribute a lot to global biodiversity. And uh, we are really uh, where some of the most important conservation actions should be taking place in. So uh, just to give you a bit of perspective, uh, two out of three of uh, Asia's threatened bird species are found in Asia. That's more than 67% concentrated in the region between Myanmar all the way east to Timor-Leste. So that shows us how important we are as a region for, for bird conservation and particularly migratory birds because we are at the middle of the East Asian Australasian Flyway. Uh, the East Asian Australasian Flyway is a, a word that pops up in almost all our presentation. And I want to quickly revisit the East Asian Australasian Flyway to give you the regional context uh, where we fit into the bigger picture for migratory birds in Asia. How important is Asia for migratory birds? How do we compare to Europe? How do we compare to North America and other continents? Asia is obviously the most important continent for migratory birds because of its sheer size. And uh, about a third of the world's migratory species, about 600 migratory species are found in this part of the world. About half of that number, about slightly more than half of that number are birds that are what we'll consider as long distance migrants. So these are birds that fly long journeys, connecting different parts of Asia towards the tropics. Some even go on to New Zealand and Australia. We as a flyway, we have, we as a continent, we have three major flyways. Uh, the two closest to us, the one which we are in is the East Asian and the Central Asian flyway. And as you can see from David's presentation, uh, we are right at the convergence point of these two flyways because we've got migratory birds coming to the Malay Peninsula, coming to Sumatra from both flyways. Uh, and these flyways, you know, um, they are important. Think of them as highway, think of them as uh, migratory corridors connecting very different ecosystems. These flyways are very important migratory corridors that connect the great ecosystems of Asia. So you think about it, you know, we are in this tropical region with all these tropical rainforests, mangrove swamps and all that. But a lot, if not the vast majority of the migratory birds that we get here come from these very complex ecosystems further north. So if we go further north uh, to China, Russia, you've got huge areas of temperate and coniferous forests. And if you go even further north to the edge of the Eurasian continent, you've got this vast 
uh, Arctic tundra, which is the breeding grounds of many, many of these shorebird species that we see in Peninsula Malaysia and uh, in Western Indonesia. Uh, as a glance, uh, we are a large flyway. Uh, we connect many different parts of the continent. Uh, we are also, uh, unfortunately, the most densely populated flyway. A lot of the world's population live on this flyway. Uh, you've got huge concentrations of people in China and Southeast Asia. And that means that uh, for a migratory bird trying to move through this flyway, it has to face a number of uh, challenges, which I'll revisit again later in my presentation. Uh, we are probably not surprised that, uh, you know, many of our migratory birds in this flyway are already considered as globally threatened. Um, some of the most endangered species of migratory bird are right here in our, our flyway, uh, some of which visit the sites that Munira and Jai studies, things like the Northman's Green Shank, for example. And where Malaysia and Indonesia lies, Malaysia and Indonesia is right on this major corridor for so many of our migratory species moving down to Australia. Uh, on top of that, a lot of our migratory shorebirds are also spending their time here for the winter. So this region is important for passage migrants as well as for birds that are spending their, their, their winter, you know, for the three, four months uh, here. Uh, as the most threatened of the world's flyway, uh, to do a quick count, about, 60, about 61 species of migratory birds in this flyway are considered as threatened with extinction, plus another 32 species, you know, that are considered as near threatened. So this is a really high and worrying number, and we want to see this number go down with conservation action going forward into the future. Um, Southeast Asia's place in the East Asian Australasian flyway. Southeast Asia, as you can see in this map, and as you have seen in maps that Chai and David and Munira has shared, is ham uh, hamburgered in between two large areas of land masses. You can see that at the center of, the, of, of, uh, of this East Asian Australasian flyway, lots of different species pass through this region on their migrations. Uh, I just use this curlew as a cartoon to just highlight that movement. Uh, but of course, David's presentation has given you all the specifics of the exact routes that these birds are taking. And the Straits of Malacca, I try to think of this as the Straits of Malacca, you know, contains some of the most important wetlands on both sides of the Straits. You've got some really important wetlands on the Malaysian side, you've got some important wetlands on the Indonesian side. Um, and many of these wetlands are already currently recognized as what we call important bird and biodiversity areas, uh, some of which uh, we are, our colleagues uh, amongst us are working in, uh, some of which are not yet recognized and hopefully will be so in the coming years. Um, the work of people like Karunas have uh, resulted in the discovery of sites that we don't even know about, you know, just years ago. And that adds on to uh, where we should prioritize our conservation efforts for shorebirds in this part of the world. Um, we know that some of the most threatened species are wintering in this part of Southeast Asia. Uh, for example, uh, we've seen the case of the Great Knot, uh, a significant population of the, of the, a significant proportion of the world's populations of Northern Spring Shank, which number no more than 1,200 individuals, winter on the Straits of Malacca's coast on Indonesia and the Malaysian coastline. Uh, but that's not all. Uh, we've got also other important uh, migrants that come to this part of the region. You've got the Chinese egret, which has a, uh, regular wintering populations on both sides of the straits, uh, as well as uh, smaller numbers of the Far Eastern curlew. Um, now that we have gotten a better understanding of, uh, of, of where we sit you know, in the flyway, Southeast Asia as such an important uh, passage area and a wintering area for so many shorebirds, uh, I want to bring you a little bit further north to this region that not many of us are that familiar with. Um, this region that I've highlighted on my map in yellow um, if you dig the books and read the papers, this is where we call the Yellow Sea. And the Yellow Sea is a very important area uh, for migratory birds. The vast majority of the migratory shorebirds that we, that we see in Southeast Asia that, that comes to Malaysia that Australia and New Zealand actually passes through the Yellow Sea. Yellow Sea is obviously one of the highest priorities for conservation as a stopover ground for many of these migratory shorebirds. And currently is uh, you know, the, at the forefront of major conservation initiatives going forward, trying to protect all these key wetlands on the Korean Peninsula and on the Northeast China coast. So the Yellow Sea is something that we must think about when we think about conservation uh, on top of what we are already doing in Southeast Asia um, as part of this uh, flyway and part of the, the major areas that these migratory birds will pass through or rest and refuel on their, on their journeys up and down the flyway. Um, that said, that said, I mean, we've now gotten a pretty uh, clear idea of what we are seeing in the flyway and how important we are, Southeast Asia and the Yellow Sea, for migratory birds, especially migratory shorebirds. 
Um, we are not seeing some very encouraging signs in the populations of many of our shorebirds in this part of the world, uh, where we have long-term data, uh, especially our colleagues in Australia who have been doing a lot of these uh, monitoring for 10, 20 years, uh, we are seeing huge declines you know, in so many species of shorebirds. Uh, some of the most spectacular declines of any shorebird that has gotten us really worried is the decline of the cone-billed sandpipers. Cone-billed sandpiper is a species that's really quite rare in Malaysia and in Indonesia. In fact, uh, Thai has found the one and the only record of cone-billed sandpiper in Sumatra and the first ever for Indonesia. So it's one of the rarest shorebirds in, on the planet. And uh, what the data is telling us is that in the last 10, 20 years, numbers of cone-billed sandpiper have declined quite Starting, startingly, uh, based on the surveys that our colleagues are doing in Russia. So um, the situation is definitely not looking very good. Uh, some of you might then ask, what are the problems that we are facing for bird conservation here? What are the problems uh, faced by our shorebirds? Why are their numbers declining? First and foremost, uh, habitat loss is a huge, huge problem in our part of the world. Like I mentioned earlier on, we are living in the most crowded by way. Obviously, there's a lot of competing demand for land use, for infrastructure. And when you go across Southeast Asia, much coastline has been developed, you know, for all kinds of reasons, for infrastructural extension and all that. Yeah. Sorry, David. Uh, can yeah. you keep close to the mic? I mean, your your sound ah. went off just now. Just, okay. Yeah. 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 So jumping back, uh, one step back, I was uh, mentioning that uh, the one of the most important threats faced by our shorebirds is habitat loss, and habitat loss is driven by you know, the, the demands of economic development in the region. You see that many parts of the coastline is being developed uh, or being reclaimed to build new ports, new airports. Uh, just as I speak, we, we have, a, I mean, there's a ongoing campaigns in the Philippines, uh, in Indonesia, trying to see how we can address the development of the coastline, which are likely to affect huge areas for migratory shorebirds. So habitat loss, habitat de degradation are very, very pressing issues for the conservation of our shorebirds, as well as other migratory birds uh, like um, terns and some of these seabirds. Um, the data is telling us that mudflats especially, mudflats are such an important foraging ground for so many of our shorebirds. Mudflats are in steady decline. Uh, typically in Southeast Asia, we don't tend to think a lot about mudflats because a lot of our conservationists, we tend to talk a lot about tropical rainforests. Uh, you know, forests and all that. Uh, but in recent years, there's more and more interest in what is the situation of our mudflats in, in this part of the world. And if the graphs are uh, telling us quite obviously that mudflats are in trouble. Uh, and a lot of mudflats, as I mentioned earlier on, are being lost or being directly degraded by um, coastal uh, reclamation uh, and the expansion of a lot of these coastal infrastructure like ports and airports. Uh, Thank but you have three more minutes, Bingley. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. But on top of habitat loss, we also know that there's a wider problem of birds being hunted. Uh, and this is a very widespread problem. Uh, the work that our colleagues have done shows that bird hunting is a very serious problem happening in almost every single Southeast Asian country. And that uh, we need to do more, you know, to deal with uh, bird hunting. Uh, and moving on from there, uh, there are huge gaps in protection for many of our Southeast Asian coastal wetland sites. Uh, many of the sites that we figured out are important are still to be protected. Uh, so that means that uh, that leaves us with a lot of work to be done, you know, for, for better protecting our migratory shorebirds. Uh, going forward, what are the key actions that we need to do? What are the most important priorities uh, in the next 10, 15 years for shorebird conservation? First and foremost, we need to expand the science base. We need to do more research. Uh, and that is uh, really exemplified by the kinds of work that uh, Munira, David, and Chai is doing. Expanding our knowledge of where are the most important sites. Expanding our knowledge of how the migratory routes of different shorebird species connect these different sites. These are very important work that we need to fill up important knowledge gaps in. And a study by a colleague of ours using great knots, uh, sorry, great knots from China is beginning to show that so many of these spots that are used by the great knots on their migration are totally unknown, unknown to bird watchers, unknown to scientists. And this shows how little we know about this problem. So science is important and we need to invest more in science. Uh, there's also a, uh, the message of international cooperation that I want to highlight um, in, the, in the world of migratory bird conservation. Nobody can save migratory birds on their own. You can't work on your own and you can't act on your own. There needs to be, there needs to be international collaboration, bring together the expertise, the resources and the knowledge of different stakeholders. Uh, we talk about the government, we talk about the NGOs, we talk about the scientists and these three groups of people, they must come together and push the agenda for migratory shoppers forward. 
And uh, I'm happy to say that uh, we have a platform right now in this region. We have the East Asian Australasian Value Partnership, a very powerful platform that brings together all these different stakeholders in, in driving conservation efforts uh, forward for our migratory water birds. Um, through the partnership, there are specific task force that bring together experts with all that critical mass of knowledge on some of the most threatened species in the flyway. So uh, international cooperation is very important and structures like the EFP is helping us to move this agenda forward. Uh, but that said, we also cannot uh, forget the impact and the value of community work. Uh, how do we reach out to local people? How do we reach out to people living on these uh, coastal kampongs and get them interested to want to play a role in conservation of shorebirds? Um, I think the work of uh, Munira, for example, the work of Chai are excellent examples of uh, the energy, the dynamism going on on the ground to reach out to local people to get their interest in shorebirds. Uh, I also want to briefly share a little bit of this work that I've been working on with my MNS colleagues, Malaysian Asian Society colleagues in Sarawak. Uh, we've been doing something really similar to what Chai and Munira are doing, trying to get the local people involved uh, and engaged so that they have a stick, they have a, oh, a say in how these coasts are better managed for uh, the future of our migratory shorebirds. With that, I bring my presentation to an end. I think there are some questions that people may have raised and we are more than happy to explore them. And I want to have this uh, shameless promotion of my next event for World Migratory Birthday. Uh, next Wednesday, I have a webinar to talk about the migration of the smaller birds that we, we don't tend to think a lot about, the warblers, the robins. And if you're interested to register for it, feel free to scan your handphones on the QR code that brings you to the registration page and uh, you can join us for yet another conversation on migratory birds in Asia which is something that I feel very dearly about uh, and always uh, looking forward for opportunity to work with our colleagues all over Southeast Asia to push this agenda forward. Mm. So that's all from me. Thanks again to, uh, to uh, Jedi and to the Shawbert Peninsula Malaysia team for setting up this uh, webinar uh, and bring all of us here together to talk about this very important topic. Thanks. Thank you so much, Ding, uh, Ding Li. Oh, wow, that was amazing. I mean, to, to get an overview of the whole region you know uh, it's not common that we can get such information uh, i think that kind of information would be very useful uh, and, and if it's more how do you say it's more accessible to the public it would be good you know because people would see how how different places are connected by the uh, migratory birds and um, how we can uh, protect and conserve you know how important it is for us to protect and conserve all the different stop oversights of the habitat that they need along the way back and forth. So I think that's very, very important.